Hi, this is Privateer Station. First of all, Merry Christmas to those who celebrate. And today we're bringing you a stream number 23, Alexei's answers to sharp questions on Vasily Galvanas channel. Some of these may shed lights to the questions you guys are asking under the videos and concerns that you express once in a while, either about economic or religious or political aspects of the discussion. Perhaps you can find some answers here. Today we want to say thank you to our new members, Marina Arkatova and Dima Boychuk, thank you for joining the channel, as well as Klaus Prodidis, thank you for your continuous support. Klaus, you're fantastic. And one more thanks to Bill. Bill, and your super thanks. Very much appreciated. With this, let's go to this Q&A number 23. Alex Rostovich, former advisor to the Office of the President of Ukraine, currently in political exile over in the Europe and the United States, and Vasil Galavanov, Ukrainian journalist. Enjoy. 23rd of December, still of 2023, 9 p.m. Kiev time, as we announced. Alexei is joining us from afar. And traditionally, before we start our stream, I express our gratitude to Ukrainian armed forces for giving us a chance to continue working. And we are in a live stream. Friends, if you have any concerns, please do not have them. Write your comments and questions and commentaries and chat and below this video once we get, get it published. And we'll prioritize a bunch of questions that you left beforehand under the announcements on my channel, on Alexis' channel, and in the English language translations by the Privateer Station. Do not forget to subscribe, if you haven't done that yet, to Alexei's channel, to Vasil Galavanov's, and of course to the Privateer Station. And do not forget to click that like button. This is one of the better thank yous you can give. As well as you can become a member to support. Vasil, how many members do you need to reach to, to 50,000? 226 I'm now, and it's like almost an enchanted spell cast on me, can't climb above it. Yeah, not a good situation, guys. Do not forget to click that button, if you haven't. Right, Alexei is saying good things. Dear viewers, please continue doing that. By the way, I will say to our audience that Vasil is one of the very sober journalists, one of the real journalists in Ukraine, who never has been seen falling into any propaganda or group think and screaming at people. So if you are ever concerned and have issues with taking reality as it is, you shouldn't be watching my streams, you should be watching Vasil's stream. He actually is a good professional with a lot of information. All right, so let's go, Alexei, to our news. Let's dive into what's happening. Russians attacked Kherson. There are several fires in the city. Also, there have been several attacks, several waves of Russian UAVs today. And in the recent weeks, there have been quite a few Shahed attacks in Tsolomensk region, in Kiev, one of the multi-story buildings got hit. So do you think before the end of the year we should expect any spike, any changes before the new year? Well, right now it's difficult to foretell the main concept of Russian military leadership. Many people are saying, especially for the winter campaign, many people are saying that Russians are waiting for the real Christmas and winter weather to come. So their attacks and the blackouts during the strong freeze in Ukraine supposedly may affect people's moods about the leadership and all that. But on the other hand, I'm not in Kiev. Did you guys ever have severe frosts there, severe cold weather? No, not really, Alexei. Well, yeah, that's what I was implying. But I want to mark here that some sites about a week or two ago, they were predicting minus 15, minus 20 Celsius, but they did not quite work out. So they were trying to get us uh, afraid of weather, but then they changed it because it was not going to happen. Right, minus 15, that's probably the lowest we get in Kiev area in winter. And after that, it's maybe minus 5, freezing around 0. That's all in Celsius, so like 32 to about 25, 20 Fahrenheit. So perhaps they will be targeting some of the energy objects later, but up until now there were just a couple strikes on them. And I'm just looking at the reports of where there were 
hit or they were shot down. That tells me basically where they were targeting and you can generally track that line and see if they're targeting power stations, uh, water heating facilities. But for now, we do not see that trend yet. In any case, if they will not be attacking energy structure, they'll probably be a different task. Or perhaps they'll have several tasks, including command centers, military infrastructure objects. And they, have, I think, still continuing to achieve their goals that they stated earlier. They just are not too accurate doing that. And yesterday, there were actually some good news from the South when we took down three of their SU-34s. They were working on our Kherson front, and uh, we managed to shoot them down. And I think this missile strike and drone strike after that was sort of their retaliation to our success there. So about this high-rise in uh, Kiev suburbs, I am driving past that almost daily, and you can see it from afar. I am concerned because they almost hit the birthing place there. There is a big hospital with a maternity ward, and uh, thankfully it did not get damaged. All right, since you mentioned three jets downed, let's talk about that. On Friday, Russia lost three jets, supersonic jets, SU-34s, near Krynki region. Uh, people are saying and experts are commenting that they were probably shot down with a Patriot system, but there are some new rumors showing up about F-16s that could have been working in that area. But still, I'm seriously concerned about these rumors about F-16s. I do not believe them to be true. It's very difficult to hide a plane in the modern warfare. Russians would have already talked about that if they saw us using new jets. And it don't, doesn't have to be a Patriot. It could be S-300s that we have, and there are several other systems that could be used. And we actually downed them near Chiplinka. That's about 50 miles beyond the front line. This is generally the area where they drop those gliding bombs from. And that gives them right enough, about 50 miles, to get that to our perch near Krenki. And also sometimes they hit the right bank, including Kherson. And it seems like this was a good uh, operation, a good trap and we caught them during their mission. And I can say these were not F-16s that shot them down for sure. I can say this is an outstanding success. I wrote in my post about that. It is a very rare occurrence when three jets were downed in one episode. Now people are saying they were shot down within 12 minutes. So essentially this is one fight during one fight. And this is a very painful loss for Russian side because they also lost their crew and to prepare a good pilot, that's at least 10 years of work. And if you are the leader of a wing, then it takes even longer. And the jets themselves are expensive. They are capable of only producing five or six pieces a year. So we shut down about 50% of their year production. Plus, under sanctions, it's uh, somewhat slowed down their pace now in producing these jet fighters. And 160th Odessa Brigade of Air defense is considered to be one of the best in our defense forces. They have over a hundred downed means uh, that they shot, starting with UAVs and cruise missiles and uh, helicopters and jets. So any country could be proud of that. And I think their experience will be researched and studied in history. Next information is built, is publishing on their own, relying on their own sources. They're saying that Russia may attack Europe at a time when the United States will be without a leader, in quotes, and will be able to aid Europe only after some period, not immediately. So they're talking about the time frame when the current president of the United States will be somewhat leaving the office already between November and January of 20, uh, 24 and 25. And they're expecting Trump to take White House again. And Russia is hopeful because everything can happen, according to Bill's publication, when Trump comes back to office. Let's uh, split that into two topics. One is possibility of Russia attacking Europe, which is equal to an attack on NATO. And the second is the Trump presidency. So Russian leadership is raising stakes. Can they raise them so high to, as to attack NATO? 
I would say everything is possible because everything is happening on the front is now proving them that NATO is an incapable organization at the moment and they're actually gaining their momentum right now in the military operations. So they're rather tempted to try NATO to see what will happen if they bite. And we remember they shot about a year ago American UAV. This is a, an act of direct military aggression against the United States. Yes, they did not shoot it down, but they spilled their fuel on it to down it. And this essentially is a directed act of military aggression. And this is one of those described by 16 signs of military aggression described in the international law. And Americans let it go. So Russians are temporarily pulling that beard and uh, seeing what happens. And also in America right now, they're shooting movies about civil war that should come out in April. And this is already a second movie about civil war. And the degree of political fight here is such that they are essentially in the slow-burning political uh, civil war. And there is a risk that potentially it may spill into the streets of America and then the United States will be paralyzed for a while dealing with the, the situation. And given that uh, the power that's coming to the White House, possibly after Joe Biden, is also rather conservative with a vector of isolationism, so Russia may be also rather tempted to test America as well. So, Alexei, this opinion of isolationism, is it uh, entire right or is it just Trump? Well, Trump is the main leader of the right, so the right in general is somewhat taking that position, of course, under pressure from the Trumpian supporters, but still. Now, regarding Trump himself, nobody knows what he will actually do. Yes, he is isolationist, but he is also rather capable for rather sharp decisions. And at any moment, he can become a globalist, even more global than democratic globalists. And above that, he can also carry out ambivalent actions. He can be very isolationist on one front and conduct a missile strike on the other front or offer some deal to North Korea or Russia. That's why he is being feared by many. And the only thing what Kremlin likes about him, remember when Trump was elected first time, they actually were driving around Moscow, waving American flags with Trump. They like him because he is not initially aimed at confronting Russia. So they hope that they'll get some chance to negotiate. But nobody knows what he'll be doing. And they have certain concerns about Trump too. And they're legit. So if you remember, Russian propagandist shows before Trump won his term, they were talking about Trump being their candidate. But just about one year after Trump's election, their moods changed drastically, that Trump is not a friend of Russia. And yeah, he is absolutely not a friend of Russia. He is uh, basically, as I said, Trump is a friend of Trump. He's a friend of the United States and his own views. But he was capable of uh, several hard decisions. He transferred javelins to us, which were not transferred by Obama's administration before. It was under Trump's administration that it was actually done. He also gave an order to destroy General Soleimani, the head of special operations of Iran. And when Iran started responding, retaliating on American bases, he got nuclear bombers in the air, indicating that he may conduct a nuclear strike to stop that aggression by Iran. So many people are concerned. Nobody knows what he will do except for Trump. I would say he probably isn't sure what he will do himself. But there is definitely an isolationist strategy among him and his supporters, so that would allow a certain gray zones that would not be defended by United States or Europe, because all of these conversations about Trump perhaps withdrawing from NATO and you, Europe, do whatever you want, they're not baseless. On the other hand, if he would not like what Russia is doing, he is capable of taking very sharp decisions. I also remind that the strike with Tomahawks on the base in Syria was also under Trump. And according to some data, there were four Russian advisors who died there during that strike. So he's not too shy about using force. He is initially isolationist and initially is not set to confront Russia. That is the only reason why Russia thinks he is somewhat a favorable candidate. But what he will be doing during the next five years, four years after his winning, the elections nobody can predict. And I would dare to say Trump also is not sure about that himself. I think we'll return to that topic, Alexei, but let's go further. Vasil, a uh, couple more words. What is Trump, right? 
if Russia attacks an airfield in Poland, he is a man who can say both ways. He can say, well, it is your problem, I warned you about being more active in NATO. At the same time, he can also, in a different mood or, or a different day, he can be the one who would order to attack Russian bases in Russia or maybe Russian troops in Ukraine as an answer. And nobody knows how he will act. Which objects, once again? On Russian troops in Ukraine. Okay, on the occupied territories, right. And nobody can predict what he will do. Topic about F-16s. You are saying that they likely were not transferred yet, but the Institute of, for Research of War has actually quoted the words of Prime Minister of Netherlands that mentioned in phone conversation with Zelensky that they're preparing first 18 F-16s to be transferred to Ukraine. And in a strategic document of the Minister of Defense of Estonia, Norway, Denmark and Belgium, along with Netherlands, already are expecting to transfer F-16s before the end of the year to Ukraine. What do you think is the probability of that? It is difficult to say, Vasil. It's been a long time and it's, what, one week left till the end of the year? We'll see if they make it. All right. What if it's not one week, maybe in two weeks, right? Perhaps we have them now, right? 18 F-16s. What will it change? If these are air defense systems that they deliver to us, that is mostly air defense complication, then it will change the situation on the front. They will be able to push Russian jets further away from the front line because they have uh, Su-35s, which can see our jets, about 200 kilometers away, and they can hit our jets at 160 kilometers away distance. And many of our pilots were downed by these Russian jets from far away within the occupied territories. And due to outdated equipment, we can see maybe 70 to 100 kilometers, and we can shoot a target in the radius of 60 kilometers. So there is no parity right now. If we get F-16s with the long range air to air missiles, they definitely can push Russian jets further out. So they will probably not be able to then drop gliding bombs on our positions, because uh, right now they're dropping those bombs from about 50 kilometers from the front line. Right? That would allow our aviation to be better at attacking Russian positions, while F-16s will be holding Russian aviation at bay. Also, F-16 is a great hunter for helicopters. It has a bunch of different missiles to do that. Now, if it will be dropping JDAMs, guided bombs, guided munitions, and perhaps uh, if it will come with more missiles against radio interference systems and Russian air defense systems, then it will also allow us to breach their air defense and will allow us to work better on the front line. Will it cause drastic change on the front? I don't think so. More a niche tool in this complication. For a drastic change, we need more. We need not 18, but like 100, then yes, there will be a game-changing weapon and concentrated on one direction, they can change a lot. But I suspect we would not get a hundred of them. So, you know, so we do not change the front or do not change this war. But in some capacity, um, however they appear, I think that is a great development. So yeah, let's cheer that once we actually get them. And you know what I rely on? I do not rely on any rumors. I believe only when I see the equipment on the battlefront, right? All right, so yeah, let's wait till we actually see them in use. Dear friends, we have about 21,000 with a few hundreds watching us live, and we only have 4,000 likes. Please, let's correct that situation. If you can click that like button, we'll greatly appreciate it. I know you don't really like us asking for it, but please. And I will continue insisting on that, and also to subscribe to any of the channels, um, or all three of ours channels, <laughs> right? If you, I know you don't like when I say that, right? If you don't like it, subscribe twice, right? Come from a different account and subscribe again. Uh, subscribe your friend, perhaps, right? Your wife, uh, your grandma, maybe a pet as well, right? Okay, so another topic that is being discussed, the host of the 24th channel, Alexei Pichy got accredited at the European summit that was happening on the 14th, 15th of December and decided not to return to Ukraine. The leadership of this channel 
is making a statement that they are shocked with his decision and they could not believe that he will do such a step. What can you comment on this? I don't know why they need to make a statement about it. Because if he just didn't come back, nobody would even pay attention, right? But he probably decided to make a statement. As a journalist, he made a statement and just wanted to highlight his position. But it's his personal decision. I don't know if it's worth discussing. It's a trend. People are leaving the country. But I would remind that there are only two countries where people were fleeing from in the 20th century. It was Soviet Union and North Korea. So this trend is generally not a good one for Ukraine. Why did he run? You can look into that. Perhaps he got a conscription notice or something else. Or maybe he quarreled with somebody in power. But uh, he decided that it's not uh, his, in his future to stay in Ukraine. It is not for me to accuse him of anything from the moral standpoint or anything else. And I'm not in the judicial system as well. So it's his own, it's his own decision. I don't think I have any statements about it. All right. You made your statement. I will not press this matter further. You are not a prosecutor. You are not attorney general. It's just being resonating in Ukraine. Vasily, being honest, the person doesn't want to be in Ukraine. He had chosen a different life. Okay. So what? All right. So I will follow with a different topic because you were saying perhaps he was drafted or something. Speaking of draft, our leaders are working on the law that will be sending draft notices to our people who are living abroad. And one of our congressmen, Vadim Evchenko, already made such a statement. He said that this law will be presented during the first weeks of the work of parliament in the coming year. And it is being developed by our general command and uh, congressman. And according to that law, they will be identifying uh, applicable citizens of Ukraine living abroad. And according to the lottery or other decisions, they will be getting invitations to serve in the military. It will be their decision to return or not to Ukraine to do that. But if they refuse, this will be considered a criminal offense. So, Vasil, if Ukraine wants to survive as a country, they need to be more effective in drafting people to the front because no war of this scale can be won by volunteers. You have to have a draft. On the other hand, when the person was forced to join the military, what will happen with them? Most people who are refusers, who do not want to fight on the front, actually among many of them, there are a lot of people who want to fight, they just don't want to be used as meat. They see what's happening. They want to defend the country, but they don't want to be used or misused the way it happens. They insist that they want to be trained, equipped, and used appropriately. With an accent to used. Because we understand it depends how well you will be equipped. We're not the richest country in the world. Training, okay, we can give some basic, right? But the main concern is about being used properly, not in the meat storms, but in more effective manner. And we see how our enemy is doing that, how they motivate their people. They have a share of propaganda and a share of material compensation. Russian trooper is getting about 200,000 plus some additional money, bonuses and all. These are pretty big money for Russian village. $2,300, that's big money for them. For our troops, the system of remuneration is so difficult and so complex that one needs to be in good relations with his commander to actually be making these 100 or 120,000 hryvnias. You know, I'm getting a lot of feedback from the fighters on the front. And uh, one of them recently was talking about having worked on the automatic grenade launcher. And at any second, you're expecting a Russian mortar, or Russian artillery, or FPV drone to target you because you are definitely a worthy target of their attention. So he's working for several days on the near the front line, shooting at the Russian positions. But the commander is telling him, well, you are not exactly on the front front line. You are somewhat behind. So you're just getting the regular lower level pay. So our system is very inadequate. And even with that, it's very difficult for our troopers to get enough money. So with 100,000 hryvnias, that's what about 2,500 
dollars, it's difficult for our soldiers to actually make this money. And what they're asking is proper training, proper equipment, and proper payment. And however you twist it, monetary remuneration is definitely a motivation. It's part of it. And when you fail in all three aspects, then the popularity of your conscription will be dropping down drastically. And it's already dropping down. And we as a society do not seem to be capable to resolve it at this moment. And paradoxically, nothing is being done in order to remunerate our fighters, to take care about their families, to, you know, from these meanings and monetary rewards to the higher meanings, right? And also, just uh, in the practice, people cannot use their cards. There are different limitations of how can you use your cards, how you can use your money, what motivation you can talk about, what will happen to your motivation if we continue with these measures. It'll only be dropping down. And this is not a good path for 21st century and wasn't even good in the 20th. Because if you want to restrict something, if you want to tighten some of those things up, you need to loosen it some at some other place. In our main demotivator part is that people are not even being told truth from the official media. The second, the vice uh, director of BILD, Paul, I'm trying to remember his last name, it starts with an R and it's difficult for pronunciation. But he told me that he was spending a lot of time in Kiev, he's very active. He communicated with many representatives of the Ministry of Defense, higher ranking military and parliament and government. And what he noticed is that their statements off the record are drastically different from their official statements. Do you remember how we were winning this war morally and informationally at the beginning? We were telling the truth and Russia was lying. Now they're trying to be, I don't know how much they're lying. It's a questionable area. It's a gray area. Sometimes they say truth, sometimes, sometimes they lie. But on our side, we're starting to lie more and more. And the person who is not an expert, who just is a citizen or he was drafted in the street or he's about, he knows that it's in his future. He knows that our government is lying because everybody here knows that the government is lying. Somebody has a relative in the system, so everybody is talking. Uh, many people have their relatives and friends who are already on the front line, so they know what we lie about and what the citizen thinks. People lie when they don't want to say truth. And that means the truth is so horrible, then why am I being forced to fight for all that? So, Alexei, why they're not disclosing, I, I just want to interject here, why we're not disclosing the numbers of our losses? Vasil, it's not about the losses, really. It's about perspectives. It's about goals and tasks. What war of 19, to the borders of 91, when everybody understands that we don't have resources to do that? Well, not everybody understands that. I wouldn't say that. Right, so at least half the country, right? But you don't need to be the head of the general command or be a military graduate to understand that right now, if you're getting a conscript notice, you'll have to go to the military detachment that is uh, near Robotina for the seventh month is trying to take Takmak and cannot do so. It's only 17 kilometers away from the front line. So by the time when we get to Takmak, it probably will be not seven months, but 777 months. So the perspectives for the soldier, they do not look good. But if we get F-16s and F-35s, the situation will change, Alexei. Well, not exactly. First of all, we need a lot of them, Vasil, in order to change the situation. That's what Zaluzhny was writing in his article, that we are in scientific technical dead end. And the only way to resolve it is we have to have very modern equipment. We need a qualitative jump. So do you think, Alexei, tomahawks are modern weapons? <laughs> right, they are, but who will give them to us? Hypothetically speaking, hypothetically, they can give us a package that will dismantle Russian occupational forces in Ukraine, but they're not giving it. Can we model this situation that it may happen? No, I don't think we should be modeling it because the West doesn't know what do they want to do because they are facing more risks than and they don't have any answers. Such a politics for them means a drastic increase in risks without a solid answer to the question why. Why should we increase the risks on this front? To do what? What risk do you imply? Risk for the United States? Yeah, that if they increase their participation, they will perhaps increase the risk of actually confronting Russian troops directly all the way up to use of nuclear weapons. And what for? 
and they don't have an answer to that. That's why we don't have enough aid. And that's why it's coming slow. Even financial aid is coming slow, not even talking about arms. And without an answer to this question, I don't think there'll be anything changing. And there is no answer yet. And the soldier being drafted also doesn't have that, or he doesn't have a full answer. We have a negative motivation, right? Negative motivation is basically to prevent Russians from coming here, destroying your home, killing your wife and children. So yeah, that's what we fight on. But negative motivation at best allows you to hold the defense line. But in order to get out of your trench and go fight in the enemy's trench and push them back, for that you need positive motivation, and we don't have it. So all these cheers let's and calls, let's call upon our guys from overseas and see if they come and join the military. That smells bad because that actually leads you to dividing people into different grades, right? There are different grades already here in Ukraine. People who live abroad, people who live here, people who fight, people who don't fight, who are hiding from participating in war. And then if you look at this, is it a proposition to unite Ukrainians or to quarrel them? Everybody is talking about unity, but then the power is making steps to actually divide us. The steps that will be pitting different sides of our society to fight against each other. The ones who are at the front, they're superheroes and saints, and the others are in the civil service, they're nobodies. That's the message they're sending, and it's not a good message. All right, guys, we've been live for about 30 minutes. Let's switch now to questions, and you continue writing more questions in the commentary. Now we're starting with the questions, and we're done with the news agenda. Okay. Ask about Bulgaria and the shells that we cannot purchase. Very interesting why. We've been asking other resources and they're not telling. Guys, don't ask me. Ask Minister of Defense. Alexei, do you think we can have monarchy in Ukraine in our days? I think everything is possible depending upon our desire and want. But do we have it? Alexei, did you look at the new candidate for the president in Russia, Donsova? Do you think this is a fork for Putin? Uh, that if you take her down, you are suspect for, suspecting you don't have enough support. And if he lets her in, then uh, perhaps everybody will aggregate around her to stop it. Do you think they will let her run? Yeah, they can. Uh, but I think Putin's system is so ironclad that they'll override any numbers and he'll win regardless. In quotes, win. What will happen with Georgia, you think, Alexei? Everything will be all right with Georgia, but the question is what will be with Georgian government and Georgian politics. That's another question. By the way, using this opportunity, I want to say happy birthday to Mikhail Saakashvili, who recently had his birthday. Um, wish him health and strength to pass through these trials that he was thrown into by this current political leadership of Georgia. And Georgia is a great example. In Georgia, youth doesn't speak Russian doesn't even understand Russian, but their politics are absolutely pro-Russian. This is for our fighters for faith and language, because they think if they speak Ukrainian, they're not representing Russian interests. Here's Georgia for you. You cannot find youth that speaks Russian. They speak Georgian, they speak English, but their politics, still pro-Putin, didn't help them much, right? All right, using this opportunity, I want to also congratulate Mikhail Saakashvili with his birthday. Mikhail, we are awaiting your return to Ukraine, and we wish that you see freedom soon. We know that Mikhail is actually watching our streams. I got a message from him with the words of support, and he is thanking us for our support. And we are awaiting your return to Ukraine, Mikhail. Another viewer is writing, I do not believe that Alexei misspoke about that attack on the house in Dnieper. I think he wanted to leave that office game back then. You know what, if I wanted to leave the office, I would have. I've done that before, on the 17th of January, a year before, I just did not return back to work, and I told them I'm not coming back. By the way, both dates coincided, surprisingly. And in this case, it would be much easier for me to just write a note that I'm not coming back. I do not see why would I go for that elaborate scheme. Tell us, please, how do you see 2024 for Ukraine? We talked about F-16 already. Do you think uh, additional arms will help us? Yeah, as I said, some supplies will definitely uh, help us. They will change some tactical situations on the front. But I think the best we can hope for is financial package from United States, 60 billion and 50 billion from Europe. 
Yeah. By the way, I have to say that from Europe, 50 billion is for four years, right? It's not for one year. Exactly. So even if we are getting all that, this doesn't close all the gaps in our budget. We'll still need to uncork our gold reserves and start printing more fitness. And all these conversations, all this support from Europe, from Northern Europe, even from Japan, it doesn't help us to bridge the gap because Russia is actually increasing their budget expenses for war and we cannot because we do not really have that much money. And here's the second part of the problem. We definitely, at best, will be able to just maintain our capabilities. Russia is increasing theirs and we, at best, are just maintaining. And second part is that Euros, Norway Krones, Japanese Yenas, they do not shoot. We need ammo, we need shells, we need artillery systems. And this is problematic because the West could not relaunch their military industrial complex. They sincerely tried, but they are not there. And we may have money for the budget, but we definitely will not have enough to carry the war with. So from that standpoint, the, war, the year will be very difficult. All right, we'll continue, friends. Um, I still will insist we have 30,000 viewers and only 7,000 likes. Please uh, click that button. Click the damn button. It doesn't cost you anything and it's very easy, but it helps us for sure. All right. And oh, don't forget to subscribe. Another viewer is telling in his message, I think Alexei took the leadership of... Uh, being a test pilot for the society. Alexei, I think we miss you on the spiritual level as well. You're just commenting the tacticals here. We miss you as a spiritual leader. Well, I want to say my school is working. And if you want spirituality, we actually have new courses and new classes there. So come there. Politics is one thing. Spirituality is another. And I don't want to mix them. For example, in politics, I have enemies and dear friends and opponents. But where I act as a spiritual leader, I can teach anyone, regardless of their political or other colors, because the laws there are different. This is like being a doctor. You treat everybody, including your enemies. So these are two very different systems, and I don't want to mix them. I don't want to mix them in the same stream. That creates a cognitive dissonance. And... Alexei Rostovich, is he the same both here and there? Yeah, I'm always sticking true to my ethics on both sides, but what is war? A war is when you have an opponent that you need to perhaps shoot him, right? Or if it's politics, you need to win over that person. But if we're talking about spiritual side, the ethics is more of a healing type. You can save everybody you can save, right? You're trying to help everybody. If the person is willing to progress and evolve. A question from you do you know how to win the corruption, to defeat corruption in Ukraine? Okay, so there are two types of corruption. There is a vital corruption and a mortal corruption. Uh, vital corruption is when people take money from gains, from wins, right? And the mortal corruption is when people take money from losses, when you take money and somebody dies. In many countries, vital corruption is being legalized. Lobbyism in the United States, you can pay money and you can get your question reviewed sooner than without money. And mortal corruption needs to be needs to be destroyed mercilessly. Sometimes it's difficult to distinguish one from another, but vital corruption that actually increases productivity, you need to think how to work with it. From lobbyism to actually paying big bonuses to those people who can help our system to flourish, just legalize that, right? So why does, do you need to pay a bribe to somebody if you can just reward the person? So if somebody, for example, would want to and would be capable to build an artillery shell factory in Ukraine, we need to, first of all, provide them with means, and second, perhaps give him 10 or 20 millions on top of that to express our gratitude. So the person would feel fantastic and would help us to also achieve our objectives. And then there is a mortal bribery that's when a person knowing that him taking money from circulation will cost other people their lives right like with some people in minister of defense who are stealing some money from uh, supplies from logistics for the military so with those you need to be merciless executions i think are in uh, line for that 
And I want to quote Sun Tzu here. If you want to understand the system, look at how it remunerates and how it punishes, and you will understand everything. Now, Ukraine is walking in the way of trying to tightening the bolts, right? We cannot completely replicate Russian system that is really horrible to everybody. But in Russia, they also remunerate rather well. So they have a very horrible system that suppresses everybody, but they also remunerate those who actually fight. Because for the person who's coming to front for money from somewhere deep village in Russia, they get 2300 for that, right? This is a chance for them to change their class in the society. Now, imagine in Ukraine, if your salary is 50,000 hryvnas, all of a sudden somebody offered you 400,000. This is a change of life event. So there, that's what they're doing in Russia. We are only tightening the bolts here, and we're doing it not really skilled, in a not a skilled fashion. We are rather an anarchy-filled society, and the government doesn't have that much power. So, in essence, we are replicating more anarchy and creating more chaos in the society. The right system would have both punishment and reward. So, if we want to defeat corruption, we need to be strict, but you also need to be remunerating a good behavior. You have to be rewarding people who are achieving the goals or helping you achieve yours. But uh, in our current state, when we pick people from the street, it's not a good form. When people are afraid of military on the street, they are afraid now, right? Initially, at the beginning of war, they were glad to see a military. And these days, they're already causing people to be concerned. So this is a very bad story, what it goes to. All right, next question from a viewer. Your plan, column, wait in America, criticizing our current leadership, and come back when the elections are announced. Perhaps you won't become a president, but you'll definitely at least join the Congress, and you will be able to change the country for the better. A very serious question. No smirking. Is that your plan? My plan is to return to Ukraine the moment when the threat to my life disappears, because when congressmen from the party in power and from the head of uh, security of Ukraine, they're all screaming that Rostovich needs to be arrested immediately upon his arrival. What about court? What about due diligence and justice? This doesn't really inspire me to return to the country right now. And I know that it's not just rhetoric, right? I have other insights. It's not me not returning to Ukraine. They're doing everything for me not to return there. So when they change their rhetoric and their position, that's when I come back. Or when they disappear. All right. So if their public rhetoric disappears about Aristovich and there'll be some lull, Vasil, if I would be only looking at public rhetoric, I would not be alive right now. Right, that's what I'm talking about, just in general, if the position changes. Right. I, I'm looking at the real situation and the plans of the sides. Their rhetoric is only a cherry on top. Because if there was no rhetoric, people would think it's my phobias, right? But now there is rhetoric to support that. So, you know, if they stop attacking me personally, I'll come back. But uh, they're doing it on purpose, so I don't. And they're trying to prevent me from running in the elections. I'm telling in advance, they'll fail. But Okay, let's go further. Economic front. Is it a front as well? Or if I'm not fighting in the trench, everything else doesn't matter? Economic front is a front, regardless of who is telling you what. And information front is a front. And there is a crap ton of different fronts. Regardless of what people say, that the front is only in the trench, I want to tell you, out of 100 military servicemen, only maybe 20 are in the trench. Everybody else are not. There are soldiers who have never been in officers, who have never been since the 24th of February in the army, have never heard a shot and have never seen the death of their comrade and nobody was shot at. And there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds, at the army of 1.3 million. So in the meantime, Alexei, somebody's not being led for rotation. Yeah, Mariana, what she's talking about, that's only part of the reasons. But that's the whole structure of modern army. Out of 100 people, maybe 20 are actually fighting in the trench. The rest are in logistics and providing support. Now, when one can ask a question, do we need them there? But here's a good example. There is, for example, a service, radio electronic interference, radio electronic tracking service. They don't shoot. They tell us and our soldiers and other systems when the missile is starting to fly from Russia in our direction. They are far away from the front line. They are sitting in a rather comfortable electronic truck 
they can have tea, they can have coffee, they can snack, they can charge the phone. So they're not important, but we are alive because they're giving that information. They're also dying. Of course, their risk of dying is much less than being in the trench, but still. So if you start to gauging all these grades and all, there is never an end to that. Because even if you pick the trench on the front line, one can say, well, you're sitting in the trench, but I'm actually walking out of the trench and going towards the enemy. And then you can go deeper. You can say that I'm on the front of the spear, the front of the spear of these five people entering the enemy trench, and you're number five, you're not the real frontman. You can go into these divisions deeper and deeper, and it's all problematic. The problem is that you should not be dividing Ukrainians into different grades. This can be unofficial, and of course, it probably will exist forever. There are real cool guys up in the front and the ones who are back in uh, logistics and supply and in civilian side, but it's wrong to do it officially, on the official level. And I was always saying that without economy, there is nothing. Army is fighting because there is some economy in the background, and the society lives because there is economy, economic relations. Economic front is a front. And what's the relation for one in the enemy trench, how many people are providing for that? So you can, okay, for that, uh, Vasily, you can, it's probably 1 to 10, 1 to 15, 1 to 20. Just imagine, let's calculate that. There are five people who are, you've seen those clips from the front, right? They jumped from the armored vehicle, jumped into the enemy's trench, and they're starting to fight there. So they have a shooter and a driver in that armored vehicle in the APC. They'll leave the front immediately. They're just there to deliver the troops. Above them, there will probably be two or three drones, UAVs, and each of them is at least two or three people behind it. The pilot, the assistant, the driver, and there is also the commanding post of the company and the commanding group in the battalion structure. Then there is artillery, there is a mortar system protecting and covering them. Then there are logistics people, food, equipment, dress, chemical and radioactive defense. And these people are not on the front, but without them, the soldier will not be able to conduct his operations. So for these five who are running into the enemy trench, there's probably a hundred of people supporting them. So what, they're not heroes now? Do you know the sign of true military professionalism? This is a person who never boasts that he has some special services operations and the one fighting out there on the edge. Because the true professional understands that without communication officer, he will fail to achieve and to get the right information. He won't live for too long and he is thankful to the communication. Or another uh, to communication officer, or another example, military doctors, or political uh, aides in the companies, right? We actually tried to get rid of that post-Soviet position, but apparently we figured, when trying to get rid of them, we figured that a lot of psychological and other functions are being carried out by this. So we renamed them into moral psychological support officer. A lot of conversations, unpleasant conversations with the relatives of deceased, of the ones who perished, a lot of document work to make sure that the families actually get rewards for what happened, and that wounded soldiers also get their remuneration. So people try to empower, people in power try to get rid of them, and they were laughing at them. I would tell without these figures, a lot of things will fall apart, because commander of a company already at a situation where he just doesn't have enough hours a day to fulfill all duties. He just doesn't have enough hours. And that aid is helping him tr tremendously. Because the commander is being thrown different tasks. You've got to fill in this journal, fill in this. It, he needs about a uh, hundred hours a week at least just to do that. He physically doesn't have time. And now imagine you take one aid away from him who is taking care of moral psychological part of things. Many things will crumble, but many people consider them to be doing nothing and very ineffective presence on the front, but they carry out a very difficult part on their shoulders, right? Wounded and dead. They're in charge of all that, of processing. Yeah, one can say that they did never go into enemy trench, right? Well, there are different aids, some of them do, but I would say not everybody should go in a trench. Army is a big orchestra, and besides, except the first violin, there are people who are playing contrabass and chiming different things in the background. 
So the army is a big orchestra. And if you take society and a country at large, it's a bigger orchestra. And the army is just one part of that orchestra. Because uh, it's complex. And even if you're a super stormtrooper, you may be so fantastic and you may be so happy that you are on the front and you'll be boasting about that. But there is somebody else, right? Somebody who is fighting deeper in the, behind the enemy lines, right? If you are so cool going the enemy strange, there is somebody who is constantly behind the enemy lines. There is always somebody who is a bigger dog. And the main message should be, we should not be dividing Ukrainians. We either all die together or all survive together. This message should be always repeatedly transmitted by our leadership. And our leadership, unfortunately, is sending different messages. Next question from the viewer. Did uh, Russian interviewer Dud reach out to you to record an interview? And what would you say if others will come, like Shipman, and Gardeo, or Sobchak? I will be reviewing in every, it's a case by case. Sobchak turned to me several times, but I'm not giddy to give her an interview because I have certain concerns about her real position about this war. If I will be in a mood to argue with her about that, maybe. When I'll be bored and have nothing to do, perhaps. But right now, no. Dude is asking a good question. He's a thinking person. And I answered yes. They said yay, hooray, and disappeared. So I guess they are preparing something for now. I'm not going to chase them. And everybody else, I'm reviewing. So send me questions. Um, that's what I usually ask them. Send me your questions, and I'll see if I'll be giving an interview. I actually gave interviews to the starting bloggers who had maybe five subscri subscribers if they had wonderful questions. And I refused the very well-known Western media channels because I was not interested in their what they were looking to ask me about. All right, next question from viewer. You know answers to many complex questions. Can you please answer this one? How to feel the ground under your feet? For those who left Donbass, and left everything there besides, except the hope to come back one day? Well, it's a large question, but you need to find a way to survive everywhere, wherever you like, you live. You can wait for some heavenly thing to help you, or the fact that maybe we'll, you know, some magic that will return back to the 24th of February, but this will never happen, you understand. So you need to find ways to survive in the new place and be active. By the way, I'll bring an example here. When I was in Ukraine, I was recording voiceovers for audiobooks. It was a big and important part of my life. It was my hobby. And unfortunately, right now, I cannot do that. And one day I will ask from those who are keeping me here, away from my favorite uh, activity. They'll have to pay for that. So I was living in a very mad schedule when I was living in Ukraine. I had a crazy schedule and I still found time to do that, to record those audio books. But when you're doing, when you're finding time for creativity, that's important that you do find time. So you can find that energy, you can find something in your life that will support you morally. And then it's not just work. Like I was, you know, I was working and I was finding time to support myself with art, with creativity. Uh, next question. How will you celebrate Christmas and when, Alexei? Well, I'm a normal Soviet schoolboy in my past, right? So I'm realizing the patterns that I had in my childhood. And they tell me that you start to celebrate on about 25th of December and you finish about 21st of January through all the holidays. So all this quarrels about which Christmas is the better date. I'll say as a person who has an almost completed theological education and openly a believer, it is not important when you celebrate Christmas. There is Christmas and it's important to celebrate it. That's it. Even if one day we discover that he was born in August, it is not important when you celebrate that. Or worse, when you don't. But when you do, it's more tradition, which day you pick. It's a quarrel and discussion between bishops, not between the pastor. So... I'll be celebrating on the 24th, on 31st, on the 6th, on the 13th, on the 19th, and everything else that will come up. We'll be celebrating every occasion. All right, next question. Ammo. There are some ammo in Transnistria. Can Ukraine ask to somehow transfer them from Sandu? No, they don't have. We already transported a lot from there. And all the fairy tales about their super rich warehouses is... Uh, a myth. There is very little left, and they're of fourth and fifth categories, so that's just leftovers. 
how Alexei is going to build new security system in Europe. Alexei is the only politician who has no platform for communicating with subscribers. How do you mean I don't have? What are we doing now? The other thing that I'm not being led to a big TV, but that's not a big deal for now. We're just starting. Elections will give the access to the TV platform because there are quotas for every candidate. And not so much in parliamentary elections, but for presidential elections, there are quotas and debates. And just for that, to be able to ask and to discuss, that's important, and to get some feedback and to hear the questions. So for now, you can observe us in the way we are. As for security questions, I posted this question publicly. It has been heard. I already know that it was heard, and it was heard uh, by both the West and Ukraine. And I'm talking with a bunch of serious Western media. They actually are bringing that question up now about a collective system of security. And this is one of the fresh ideas, if not the single fresh ideas that was brought by this war. I actually want to say that the first one to bring this topic up was presidential office when he came up with a formula of peace and they continued to insist on that. I think this is not enough as an initiative. I think the world needs to change deeper. But this was stated as a subject. I just need, we, I think we need different principles to work that. But still, even our power found in itself to call that out, that our current defense system, a security system doesn't work and it needs to be changed. That's an obvious thought, just different approaches that we have. All right, next message, I understand from the context from Israel. In our war with Hamas, we use a special attachment to a rifle that allows us to see and destroy UAVs so Hamas cannot use drones. And our economy is pretty good. It takes about four bullets to shoot the drone down. We've been already, uh, we had that in rotation for two years already. Why don't you guys have that in Ukraine? Okay, so dear friends, I have, I don't know how many friends in Israel you have. I have a ton of friends in Israel on different levels from the highest to the lowest. And they're always talking about the UAV danger, about losses they suffer from drones and all kinds of UAVs. And they're estimating that when they fight with Hezbollah, they'll probably suffer bigger losses. So if somebody has fantastic weapon that allows to fight more effectively against UAVs, I'll immediately please forward me that information. I'll forward that to your leadership who perhaps is not aware of them or perhaps not considering them an effective weapon. It's the first time I hear about this attachment. I'm not, of course, an uh, all-knowing person, but um, I'm curious. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there are a lot of questions. Uh, remember, usually questions I see are rather simple. Remember, everybody was laughing at Russian uh, grills on the tanks, trying to defend them from javelins. So Israeli tanks are actually, I've seen them driving with the same contraptions on top. And I know there are UAVs, like last week there was a UAV who killed a soldier and wounded another one. So UAVs are a tricky thing, right? You all see online that they're effective and they destroy the equipment and people. But uh, who talks about, right, that there were probably seven other UAVs that were destroyed before the eighth was successful. So if by any chance you do have some interesting weapon design that is uh, working and effective, please send the information. We'll forward it to the right people. Next question about a tragedy that happened in Czech Republic when a shooter killed 14 and wounded 25. What do you think needs to be done in Ukraine to prevent these things? We understand these shooters exist everywhere in every country, but... Oh, we already had one who threw grenades at the council meeting, right, in Zakarpatia. So, same thing. Remuneration and punishment. You need to reward psychological rehabilitation. I think that every serviceman needs to go through psychological rehabilitation. It's a must have, must uh, happen, must thing that must happen. So you cannot demobilize without, you cannot leave military without going through that. Especially during rotation, if there is time to do that, please do that. And we need to have a big national program of psychological aid. People need to be trained, people need to know and know how to deal with it. And I would start it with kids starting with eight or 10 years old. They need to understand the basic symptoms of psychological exhaustion, of certain deviations. 
as any society, we need to teach that. As any society in a long stress situation, we need to be very aware of these things. And people need to be rewarded for all kinds of help. This help needs to be free for soldiers. And it needs to be very well thought out. In regards to the negative, then this is the work to punishment. This is the work of uh, security services and different services that need to prevent that. Starting with a banal metal detector at the entrance to the university and high school and finishing with the work of uh, police and other enforcement agencies that need to find how to work with this. And uh, it's obviously difficult to fight with um, single shooters who have something on their mind. So probably hardening the targets as well as psychological work. So what do you think about situation in Zakarpatia? Of course, there are no frames there. Well, right. The guy who did that, who threw the grenades, he actually recorded the video before going and doing it. And when people say that everything is just in your mind and it's undiscoverable, they usually leave traces. It's just nobody believes in their intentions and nobody pays attention to that. And it's important to believe because that guy actually made his intentions known. He recorded a video of appropriate character. He sent a message before escalating to the grenades at the council meeting. And many people are saying that, who are familiar with the situation, said that he tried to achieve certain justice and he was ignored, so he made himself hurt. So I guess we need to learn how to hear. You know why this topic is so difficult, Vasil? There is no criteria. Uh, there are some jobs where it's very difficult to set the criteria. How do you gauge it, right? There is a service, a suicide prevention line. How do you measure that? How do you measure their effectivity? Right, it's difficult. Well, you can maybe run the stats of suicides, of course, probably in the long run. But after a certain event, for example, there could have been a thousand suicides after an event, but we only had, let's say, 300, right? Only in quotes. But it's difficult to measure these things. And it is important and it needs to exist. Many countries have it, they actually have budget expenses for that because it's difficult to measure, but they understand that it's important. So KPIs are unknown, right? There always will be individual psychos who will take, if he doesn't have access to guns, he'll take a knife or he'll take a wooden club or something and will kill maybe two people or four, and maim four. This is deviation of human psyche. These people will always exist. But how many can we preclude from happening if we create a prophylaxis system, psychological prophylactic system? It needs to exist. It need, we need to continue working with it because without it, there'll be more incidents. It's difficult to enumerate them, but there definitely will be more other ways. Our Congress voted for 7457 project for legalization of medical cannabis. And uh, it was blocked after, but it is expected to be allowed later and the block to be lifted. All right, so there are a lot of arguments around cannabis. And one side is saying it's so fantastic and it has no long-lasting consequences. Serious doctors are already seeing that there are different, def definitely some consequences for human, human mind, human brain after that. If you inhale an active substance, it definitely has some effect. Everybody is adult. You cannot have only positive effects. Everything is poison. Everything is cure, right? Depending upon the dosage and proportion. But indeed, it has a certain medical effect. Cataracts, pain relief, psychological uh, aid. So as long as, in my view, it needs to remain a medical aid. It shouldn't be legalized as a drug. Just like we see it here in the West, where you can buy them in store, on a vending machine. I think this is wrong practice. As a medical treatment, yes, absolutely, it has a proven effect. And it should be available as a medical. Just a simple NSAID and neurologesics have that effect, right? But it doesn't mean that you should be taking ibuprofen daily. Well, we yet still have sales of alcohol, right, Alexei? Yeah, alcohol is a bane of humanity. We know that it probably is more harm than from cannabis. Uh, it is guaranteed, but it doesn't mean that cannabis is harmless. And yet cannabis is no, and alcohol is allowed. But it's a traditional thing with our civilization. 
the tradition of drinking exists for probably tens of thousands of years. And it's a more difficult thing to fight with. You know, like in the historic books, being happy in Russia is to be drunk. That was said by one of the dukes early on in the early hundreds. Yeah, so it's difficult to prohibit. Okay, let's continue further. 35,000 watching us, 11,000 likes. Guys, that's hard. Please do something about it. And do not forget to subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it's very nice for me. All right. So about what may happen in 2024 after when Putin will announce himself to be a president of Russian Federation again, what can he go for after these elections in quotes? What they call elections in Moscow. Strategy of Russia is rather crystal clear right now. They will continue exerting a pressure on us and Europe, mostly on us on the battlefront. They will continue capturing territory as much as they can, and cities and towns, and try to get to the borders of Lugansk, Donetsk, and Kherson and Zaporozhye regions, which they added to their constitution, and announced that they joined them to their territories. Because once you announce that, you declare that, you need to liberate them in their meaning of life and uh, occupy them as we see it. So they just want to hang on till the beginning of election campaign, active the last active phase of election campaign, probably by autumn next year. So they want to make sure they have good results by that time. They are preparing, uh, as far as we know, rather strong offensive after Putin reinstates himself as a president with the tasks to finish the capture of these four regions that I mentioned. Some people talk about Sume in the north and Kharkov. I suspect it may be some sort of maneuver there, but I don't think they'll be aiming to capture that. So they'll be continuing that pressure and showing to the West the perspectivelessness of supporting Ukraine in the long run. So they will continue doing that, and it's a question of how much they will pay for that, how much we will make them pay for that. And they'll probably come to the American elections with the main demand to give them these four territories, or they will continue that pressure and we'll try to ask for more if we bend and if we fail somewhat in the front. And it depends upon the West, how much will be supplied and how much can we also train and uh, find our own resources to keep the front line. So these two elements have some concern in my mind that I've been voicing over and over again. And that's about the aid from the West and about our ability to raise our own resources. And uh, the only factor here is that Russia is not in a good shape to capture things easily. You can see that it took them about half a year to capture Avdiivka. It is a very small town, barely a town. And it took them several months to concentrate troops, and active uh, attacks were lasting for over two months already. In such a tempo, they cannot get to English Channel uh, or to Dnieper quickly. But it is all is hinging on some sort of Western aid still coming to Ukraine and thus still manufacturing some means to fight. Because if we completely have zero or the West just shuts down all kind of support, then the front will collapse. So the key question is still the question of the aid from the West. The West is definitely wavering and Russia is trying to make sure they stumble more and they wave more and they have more concerns for that. They have Fitzo, they have Orban, they have other levers, and they'll be using them. They're already using them, they'll be using them more. Do you think there is a risk in 24 of new areas, of new red areas, new hot areas in the world? Oh yes, they are, because Putin managed to open another angle of this war, Russia against NATO, a global war against global West, global South versus global West. And I think this is one of his most successful achievements during his career, definitely during this war. So the war in Israel already problematized the degree that the West can help Ukraine. Because these, uh, remember the situation with 70,000 shells that were removed from Israel, sent to Ukraine, and then took back from Ukraine to Israel because Israel was running out. That shows how difficult situation is in the West. And now imagine the third conflict started where, for example, they have partners and they need to support them. Taiwan, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Lithuania, 
Finland, Venezuela, Guyana, right? They're already not interfering yet. Or Yemen, right? What if that situation and this military naval operation turns to be a ground operation as well? What about Finland, Alexei mentioned? Do you think there's going to be a real hot conflict there? No, there it could be just migrants, right? Migrants attacking the border, and that can always create additional risk, and it will be a kind of a hybrid warfare there. So I don't know what the West will do if there'll be more conflicts, more hot zones on the map. And those who are playing against the West, they will definitely try to create a third or fourth conflict, where they'll have to interfere and be more paralyzed. And then the West will try to somehow cover that and will be probably more prone to negotiating. So in the commentary, that were there were hundreds of them under the nonce of this conversation. Of course, there were a lot of words of support, words of gratitude to Alexei, sending them to you wholesale. Of course, there was always a lot of hate. You're rather used to that as well. I'm not going to transfer that, just will say that it existed. And many people were noticing and thanking for that psychological support. Yeah, do you see that? I'm reading the chat that's happening there. I'm seeing all that. And many people were thanking in the in the chat and the comments for the psychological support that you provided at the beginning of this war. So I want also to ask you now to give some positive vibes to our audience in this stream. Well, positive vibes and calming down is based on very basic things. In this case, Russia doesn't have a potential to defeat Ukraine quickly. It's problematic for them to destroy Ukraine as it is, and to do it faster, it's even more problematic. So depends how he calculates the troops that he has. We say that he has about 400,000 altogether, but they fail to create any proper operative level operation. That would be 100, 200 kilometers deep, 100, 200 kilometers wide. And only these operations would allow them to hope, for example, to capture the whole left bank of Dnieper. And such a sad and slow push that they're doing exerting now, this is a very bad proposition for them. So that allows us more time. This is basically what I'm saying to our allies uh, when we're gathering money and resources to aid our military. By the way, under that stream, there'll be another collection another fundraiser, so please participate if you can. We usually raise two, three hundred thousand hryvnas in one stream. So we do help them and we do buy time. Winning time is always allowing to bring new factors to the war, right? Both negative and positive, but we may expect the West to wake up at some point. There likely will be more elections, European Parliament, other countries. Maybe somebody in Ukraine will wisen up. Maybe our government and leadership will be better. So this always gives hope, right? This gives hope that we can change that situation. And while there is a window to do something, nothing is lost. We know what needs to be done in the country. It's more of a question who will be doing that. But that question will be solved one way or another. I don't think we're facing a total defeat and death, but we are facing reformatting Ukraine. This is our only hope, actually, that we will reformat the country. And whether it will be official through elections, through some government of national rescue, or will it be because of the people's revolt? That's a big question. But right now, you can increase our effectiveness times by several times. It's just uh, not being done because of the old corrupt system still in power. And our main enemy is a corruption system that is still holding Ukraine in chains and taking away our freedoms and our victories. So we need to win it, to win over it. And Ukraine will either resolve this problem or will die. And Ukraine would have died even without Russian pressure because that system was killing Ukraine. So it actually is pushing us to evolve, to be better. And I'll use our Caucasus saying that I know a man is the one who can not just fight, but who knows who the enemy is. That corruption system is our enemy. We know that, we realize that. So there is hope that we will resolve it one way or another. In the meantime, our army is buying time for us. Dear viewers, I want to ask you once again to subscribe to Alexei Rostovich's channel. The link will be down at the bottom and his Telegram channel, it will be there as well. 
all those who watched us live, thank you very much. Those who are watching a recording or a translation, thank you as well. And take care of yourself. Ukraine will win one way or another. Alexei, thank you so much. Thank you, viewers. Thank you. Merry Christmas. And thank you from the privateer station as well for staying with us. Till later.